Case Western Reserve University's Great Thinker Series proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. These lectures are presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. With the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and MediaVision. Tonight it's my pleasure to welcome Patricia Princehouse, who is Director of Case Western Reserve University's Program in Evolutionary Biology and our new upcoming program in, uh, in our major in Origin Sciences, and is Outreach Director for the Institute for the Science of Origins. She earned her bachelor's degree locally at Kent State University and then went off to Yale University for her master's and to Harvard University for her PhD where her re she developed her research interests in paleobiology, genetics, and artificial life and digital organisms, as well as the history and philosophy of science. She has also bred more than 100 American Kennel Club champion dogs, and dogs of her breeding have earned more than 1,000 titles in events around the world. So tonight, I'm very pleased to pr present Patricia Princehouse talking about the paw prints of history, evolution, and dog behavior. Dr. Princehouse. So, thank you for coming tonight. Um, there's a dog named Zangir who lived in India. He's a purebred Labrador retriever, and he was used by the Mumbai Police Department. And about a year after uh, he started his training, he was just 14 months old, uh, were the Mumbai bombings. And Zangir was up to the task. Uh, I don't know if you remember these, there were 13 blasts, uh, one after the other. Uh, 350 people were killed, it was terrible. Uh, it was very shocking to the world. The next, what they, people don't know is that the next day, Zangir found four other times that that, places that that was going to happen around the city. And uh, in fact, there was not another one the next day. Uh, one of them was a scooter bomb, he's walking down the street, he says, I smell something. There was a scooter with a bomb there. Another one was in a very busy bazaar um, market area, and also a suitcase bomb in a temple. Zangir did a lot of other things in his career, uh, helped recover a bunch of bombs in various places. Um, the Mumbai police were said to have so much confidence in Zangir that often they would just take the dog. They wouldn't take any of their other equipment. <laughs> um, and even, some even asked after the thing, why no Nobel Peace Prize for Zangir the dog? When he died, he was given a uh, full state funeral, which is very beautiful in India. <laughs> this, on the other hand, is Sonu. Sonu is a village dog, uh, what's called an in dog or Indian native dog uh, from Gujarat. And without any training, Sonu guarded the neighborhood around uh, the village, around, uh, around the clock, and was everybody's favorite. When she died of old age, she was 18 years old. And they also had a funeral for her. Here are the ladies pouring vermilion on her body in preparation for burial. Here she is covered in flowers. Um, and uh, people came and paid their respects. And uh, given the, the religious system there, I know Hinduism is a huge and highly varied thing, but I wonder what form Sonu might be reincarnated in, given her extreme virtue in this life. And in these examples, we may notice their loyalty to us, but also our loyalty to them. Uh, and this sense of shared purpose, it's an intuitive sort of attitude toward community, toward work, uh, toward how to live. Uh, and it seems like something transcendent shared by dogs and humans. Now maybe that's just anthropomorphic sentimentality, right? But a lot of people very often feel that dogs embody special virtues that humans aspire to, but achieve with much less frequency. This is a Newfoundland dog. It's a breed selectively bred from European and North American dogs for its altruistic willingness to rescue people at risk of drowning, used by sailors and this sort of thing. Um, the poet Lord Byron had a Newfoundland. It was a popular breed uh, at that time. Um, its name was Boson. It was a little like this dog, only black. When he died, uh, Byron put up a big tombstone. He was heartbroken. Uh, and he put two things on it. One, this part up above, he says, near this spot are deposited the remains of one who possessed beauty without vanity, 
strength without insolence, courage without ferocity, and all the virtues of man without his vices. This praise, which would be unmeaning flattery if inscribed over human ashes, is but a just tribute to the memory of Boson, a dog, born in Newfoundland, May 1803. And he wrote a poem, uh, a strong poem, uh, just for the dog. Uh, he says, when some proud son of man returns to earth, unknown by glory but upheld by birth, the sculptor's art exhausts the pomp of woe, and storied urns record who rests below. When all is done upon the tomb is seen, not what he was, but what he should have been. But the poor dog, in life the firmest friend, the first to welcome, foremost to defend, whose honest heart is still his master's own, who labors, fights, lives, breathes for him alone, Unhonored falls, unnoticed all his worth, denied in heaven the soul he held on earth. While man, vain insect, hopes to be forgiven and claims himself a soul exclusive heaven. O man, thou feeble tenant of an hour, debased by slavery or corrupt by power, who knows thee well must quit thee with disgust, degraded mass of animated dust. Thy love is lust, thy friendship all a cheat, thy tongue hypocrisy, thy words deceit. By nature vile, ennobled but by name, each kindred brute might bid thee blush for shame. Ye who perchance behold this simple urn, pass on, it honors, no, it honors none you wish to mourn. To mark a friend's remains, these stones arise. I never knew but one, and here he lies. So leaving apart uh, Byron's idiosyncr idiosyncrasies, his poetic talent. Um, this idea of canine virtue is very common, and it's cross-cultural. And in fact, dogs do frequently perform what you've got to consider to be altruistic acts uh, that benefit people, but not, the, not themselves. <clears throat> so our question is, how does this evolve, this being sort of the phenomena? Um, so let's think about that for a minute by looking at a close cousin of dogs, which is to say wolves, because dogs are descended from wolves, that almost never uh, evokes admiration for their community spirit, coyotes. So on the one hand, we have Canis lupus, the wolf, uh, close cousin to our dogs and its ancestor. Um, it's a big animal. On the lower right, you have the, uh, the lower left, rather, you have the um, uh, coyote, Canis latrans, right? Um, a lot of people don't realize how much smaller coyotes are than wolves or how much bigger wolves are than coyotes. But wolves are a big dog, uh, you know, bigger than even most of our breeds, 30 inches tall, 40 inches long, 100 pounds or more, and they can run over 30 miles per hour. Right? The coyote is small, it's shy, it lives in small packs, it hunts alone or in pairs, whereas the wolf is intensely social. It can be often in large packs and hunts generally in groups of at least six. Uh, the coyote, although it's smaller, can run faster than the wolf. Uh, and so perhaps it doesn't need to have as much company when it's hunting. Uh, but they're really uh, surprisingly different, uh, given how closely related they are. Uh, their genetics are uh, you know, nearly identical, much more similar than us and the chimpanzee that you hear a lot about, far more similar than rats and mice. Uh, they're behaviorally, though, very different, as we mentioned. Um, they are a mate recognition species, so you can actually cross wolves and coyotes and produce fertile offspring. And that happens to a certain extent in the wild. But for the most part, uh, they, they can tell by looking that that's not their own kind, and they stay apart. That's called a mate recognition species. But they had a shared evolutionary heritage until very recently. Uh, here's the uh, family tree. Uh, you can see us splitting off about a little under 90 million years ago. Uh, then you have the, uh, the carnivorans, you have cats, and then bears and foxes branch off, and then you have wolves and coyotes. You can see it this way uh, a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of uh, animals that have gone extinct among the carnivorans. I mean, it's true of any lineage, but uh, uh, more so than a lot that you might look at. And you don't start to get things that are really very dog-like until around 15 million years ago. Dog-like meaning wolf-like, right? Or, um, and then the dog and wolf split uh, sometime uh, uh, a little bit, say, between 20,000 and 60,000 years ago. And uh, coyotes split a little bit before that. And you can see how closely related, even within the Canidae, the, the dog family, uh, wolves, dogs, and then the next group out is coyotes. Thank you for joining us. 
You've been watching Dr. Patricia Princehouse discussing altruistic dog behavior. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Dr. Princehouse discusses the connection between altruism and group selection. Now, back to the talk. All right. Now, I, uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but at the uh, Dittrich Medical History Center at Case Western here, uh, we have a collection of Darwin letters. We have 180 Darwin letters. Uh, these are largely letters written by Darwin, uh, but some written to Darwin, so his correspondence. And it centers on uh, two different uh, uh, correspondence, uh, one more scientific, and uh, the other one is Reverend John Innes, <coughs> Darwin's local vicar. And the donor who gave us this set of letters was very, very, um, very, very interested in not just collecting memorabilia, but re really looking at things that, that have historical value. And so he concentrated his collection onto these two areas. And I was lucky enough to be able to use this collection uh, for teaching uh, over the past 10 years or so. And going through the letters, at one point I found this one uh, letter, and it had dogs in it. So I sort of paid attention, you know, and it's a great quote. He says, dogs are wonderful animals and deserve to be loved with all one's heart, even when they do steal the mutton chops. We don't have the other letter, the one that Innes had sent him with the story, what Darwin calls the, the curious story of the dog and the mutton chops, but we have this response to it. Looking at that letter, I realized then uh, that this is actually a very important letter because it's written to his vicar, right, to his local pastor, uh, right after the, uh, his second major work, The Descent of Man, came out. And so uh, another major part, the first part of the letter, concerns that. And Darwin writes to him, he says, I've been very glad to receive your pleasant letter. For to tell you the truth, I've sometimes wondered whether you would not think me an outcast and a reprobate after the publication of my last book. I do not wonder at, at all that you're not agreeing with me, for a good many professed naturalists do not. Yet when I see in how extraordinary a manner the judgment of naturalists has changed since I published The Origin, I feel convinced there will be in 10 years as much unanimity about man as far as his corporeal frame is concerned. Anyhow, my views do not lead me to such conclusions about Negroes and slaveries, slavery as yours do. I consider myself a good way ahead of you as far as this goes. And in the time, and Darwin, if, you, if you're familiar with his history, he's, he's a rather diffident person. He's not one to make strong assertions. And this just sort of knocked me upside the head. He's telling his vicar that he considers himself a good way ahead of him morally as far as these issues of slavery go. Uh, that's very interesting from someone who's just published a book giving a naturalistic view of how human, hum, humans came to be. He says, at least in their corporeal frame, but you know that he means as far as their morals as well. And part of this is coming from his, his own and his family's history as abolitionists, but also his admiration for uh, the American Revolution. And so he was reading things like the Declaration of Independence, where it says governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. They're not something handed down, forced on by nature. They're something that we construct together. And the young Darwin on the Beagle voyage looks at this and he says, wow, if this is our making, if the misery of our poor, because not by the laws of nature, but by our institutions, great is our sin. And he's talking perhaps as much in a religious context there, but giving us more responsibility. <clears throat> now, a lot of this impulse comes from Immanuel Kant. And Kant was fascinated by Newton, as I'm sure a lot of you know. And he said, you know, Kant, of course, is a big thinker and very famous for this. Uh, he says, two things fill us with wonder and awe, the starry heavens above and the moral law within. Now, for him, Newton had largely given a, a scientific basis for uh, understanding why we have the starry heavens above. Kant tried in his time to understand a, a sort of scientific basis for the moral law within. He even hit on the idea of natural selection, but he considered it just too grim to possibly be entertained. Uh, and so he, you know, he, his third book, which pretty much nobody reads, is on aesthetics. But the second one is on morals. Um, so 
if you're going to have a biological science, and biology includes the mind, then you need to have some understanding of how that came to be. So two of Darwin's thorniest problems were organs that he called organs of extreme perfection, such as the eye, and instinct or behavior. And he says at times just contemplating the eye gave him the cold sweats. But as he thought about it, he could see how an eye could be made piecemeal with each, uh, you know, even just a, a, an ability for light to be detected in some manner would be useful to the organism. And different elements that might then be recruited to uh, improve that uh, could step by step through natural selection build something even as complex and perfect seeming as the eye. The eye is not as perfect as he thought it was, which we could go into in the questions, but it is very impressive, as are a lot of adaptations out there. Uh, but through using what he called slight successive modifications. And he says, he spends a, a fair amount of time in the origin talking about behavior and instinct. He was especially fascinated by how wasps and, moths, uh, wasps and bees build their honeycombs, right? Bee honeycombs with their, their six-sided structure. Uh, how perfect they can be. How is it that these bees can build these without, you know, obviously they're not going to diagram them out. They just know how to build them. He says, well, if you look at them, they vary somewhat. And if the organisms that are building the ones that are maximized for its purpose are then favored and leave more offspring, then their offspring are going to build more perfect nests. So slight successive modifications, not only in morphology, but in behavior can produce all of the things we see. Now, natural selection was not the only mechanism of evolution that Darwin cared about, but it was sort of the prize, right? It was, it was the thing that explained adaptation, which is what was the most interesting thing, and still is to most people. To make natural selection work, natural selection is sort of like a little engine that turns over. You need a lot of things, but you can put them into these three rough categories. So you need super fecundity, which is a fancy way of saying that more offspring are born than can possibly survive. So if you look out on Euclid Avenue, and there's a tree there, and it's got some leaf hoppers in it, you've got the, the mommy and daddy leaf hopper. They produce not 2.3 children, but they produce 5,000 or, or more, right? All of these baby leaf hoppers. They can't all survive, right? You know that on average, they're only going to send two into the next generation. In fact, if it were two and even a sliver of something, the space between the Earth and the Sun would very soon be filled with leaf hoppers. So it has to be on average two. Right? Um, it's not enough that you have too many babies. Uh, they have to differ, right? Otherwise, it would just be the static thing. And so you will find in these babies a huge range of variation in all sorts of different features. Um, and that variation is generally uh, random with respect to the needs of that organism. Right? That still wouldn't matter, right? Because it could just be random as to which ones are kept. In order for natural selection to work, that variation needs to be in some manner heritable. Once it's heritable, then the ones that are surviving of those great many that were produced uh, are more likely to leave offspring that look like them, and that is how natural selection can build adaptations. Right? Now, we think of this in the way that I just described very often at the, this individual or organismal level. Right, of, of one individual body and another individual body in that population. Right? But there are more ways to think about this, and Darwin thought about that in more ways. And in particular, uh, he was puzzled by certain classes of behavior that require special uh, explanations, uh, what we today call group selection and what the um, uh, Russian Darwinians called uh, mutual aid. Right? And so Darwin says, just as two canine animals might struggle against each other in a time of dearth, so does the plant at the edge of the desert struggle against the drought. Right? And so uh, especially a lot of the Russians chose this because it's not the lush jungle where you have everything competing. It's in fact, if you look on the, uh, uh, on the steppes, uh, often you get very intensely social groups of organisms, caribou, things like that that support each other. Uh, and so the idea then is that at the group level, individuals who behave in a cooperative manner within a group leave behind more offspring because the whole group is more likely to survive. And now, of course, if you've read the book The Selfish Gene or heard about that, we talk about selection on a lot of different levels. But a lot of people, even who fully accept the selfish gene model, stop short at group selection. It's got this feeling against it. 
Um, but uh, anyway, beyond that, it's not just that qualities that pertain to groups can cause a certain group to be, you know, to have advantages over another. It's that it's not limited only to, uh, you know, aggregate properties, right? So all the critters in that group happen to be beige, and beige is adaptive. You can say, well, that's selection of that group of beige organisms over one that's gray, but that's not something that pertains to the group per se. Uh, you know, this makes the stronger claim that there are what are called emergent properties. Um, and in that case, some surprising things can happen. Uh, you've probably all seen nature movies of leafcutter ants. Um, leafcutter ants uh, chop up these leaves. They don't eat the leaves. They bring the leaves back to the nest, and they chew them up, and they spit them out, and they feed a colony of fungus. This is called a fungus garden, this thing on the lower right. Okay. And that is the queen ant on top of it. And all of the workers are very small compared to her. And uh, uh, the workers uh, uh, are, uh, are, are sterile. They don't reproduce. So you have this colony and all of this activity. And it happens in bees. It happens in lots of ants, right? Where uh, you have individuals who are laboring strongly and not producing any offspring. How can that be selected for? And Darwin knew about this situation. And he put a lot of thought into it as well. It's interesting because. Uh, it's not only the fungus garden and the ants, but in order to keep the fungus garden uh, from being overrun you know, by things or from using up all of the resources, the ants have a, um, a sort of an antibiotic film on their bodies. And so it's this complex balance between all of these factors. The workers have to bring the leaves. They have to chew them up just right. They have to keep the fungus garden going. They have to weed the fungus garden to make sure that it has only the kinds of fungi that are useful for the thing. All of this has to go. And so this is sometimes called a superorganism because you've got a lot of different species there uh, working together as one unit. If anything goes wrong, everybody dies. Right, and so uh, you know, workers going along, uh, you know, graduate students out, they find these nests. They don't find all the ones that failed because there are no ants going back to it. So it's everybody, you know, all for one and one for all. Um, and as I'm sure many of you also know, it's not only ants and bees, uh, but there are some mammals. There are two kinds of rodents that also have uh, this uh, use sociality, as it's called, uh, with many individuals who do not reproduce and one main queen in the nest. This is Cynthia Bell's favorite organism. So what about humans in all of this? What can that tell us? Um, especially in groups that are not sort of obligate eusocial. Um, Darwin said basically that an individual altruistic person in a population uh, might be at a disadvantage surely be at a disadvantage if they give up their life for somebody else to live, and nobody else will do it for them. But he says groups that faithfully maintain a high level of moral or altruistic behavior have an immense advantage over groups that do not. And this brings us to game theory, because how are you going to think about all of these uh, individual benefits and costs and things like that? Now, some of you will have seen the uh, movie about John Nash called A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe. He, um, dealt with non-cooperative uh, group theory, um, game theory, rather. Um, he drew from John von Neumann, who was sort of the originator of game theory. And his work, von Neumann's work, also talked about cooperation, and especially something called reciprocal altruism. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, that sort of a thing. And the sort of classic you know, problem with that is, what happens if somebody cheats? You scratch their back, and they don't scratch your back. And they, again, the classic case of this is called the prisoner's dilemma. And if you can, you can see up here. So you've got these two guys that have been found with stolen goods on them, right? And they say, look, here's our story. We both keep the story. And we're going to serve only six months each, right? Because they can't prove that we actually did it. We just received stolen goods or whatever, right? So if they both keep it, if they both choose to cooperate, then they have six months in prison. And that's not too bad. If they both cheat, they end up with eight years each, right? Because one guy tells on one, the other guy tells on the other, they get that. But if one of them cooperates and the other guy cheats and says, oh, no, he did everything. I was just standing there. Then this guy's going to get 20 years, and this guy's going to get off free, and vice versa over here. So how do you keep a situation where everybody's cooperating? Um, and 
of course, this, when you're thinking about this in an evolutionary context, requires all kinds of variables, right? Um, when, you know, it's not just sort of the, the, the warden coming out and saying, here's how it's going to be. Um, serious cases such as infanticide, for example, when a dominant male will take over a, a troop, uh, he'll sometimes, and this happens in a lot of mammals, uh, he'll sometimes kill the babies in order to bring the females back into heat so that he, now, he doesn't really know he's doing this. He, he just has feelings, oh, you should kill that one. It doesn't look like it belongs, right? And the evolutionary explanation is that that will bring the female back into heat. He can then have his own baby to raise in the population, right? But if you think about that, you can't just look at it. That's sort of the prisoner's dilemma side, right? You have to think about, okay, is that really an advantage to him? What if, for example, it's late in the year, this female comes back into heat, uh, she has his baby, it dies of starvation over the winter, partly because it was born too late and partly because you don't have that now juvenile around to help uh, feed the troop, right? And so it's, it's, it becomes extremely complex. And of course, when you take into consideration that these are not sort of simple Mendelian situations of alleles, uh, that there's in fact a complex genetic background in here, um, in a way, uh, game theory is more useful in biology than it is in economics because in, you know, in biology, nature inexorably goes toward the logical conclusion, whereas with human economics, human culture is fickle and anything might change, right? Uh, but uh, anyway, people claim, oh, that's no good, in the long run it won't work, but uh, there are lots of, and an increasing number of examples in the wild of just this sort of, uh, of reciprocal altruism, even among unrelated organisms, right? And so that's, that's the thing there, is that they would be unrelated. Uh, and so in the 60s, you had a lot of people going around saying, oh, well, selection can cause, uh, you know, good things to happen just for the good of the species. And that's a lot of what people are responding to, that that sounds like garbage, right? And here you have, for the good of the species, here's this little guy hiding from this leopard going, going across there. This is a vervet monkey, a baby vervet monkey, being very acrobatic there. Now he is hiding because an adult male in the group, and these are multi-male, uh, multi-female groups, and uh, they're highly social. They, they live in the same areas. They spend a lot of time on the ground, but also some time in the trees. And it's rather open woodland, so there are also predators that come from the sky. Now, that baby is able to hide because he heard one of the adult males start shrieking with one of three alarm calls. They ha are so specific on this. There are a lot special alarm calls for leopards uh, or lions, but usually it's leopards, special ones for snakes, and special ones for eagles. And if you tape record them and play them back, if we play the eagle one, all the monkeys start looking at the sky. They all know this. And you play the others, the snake one, they start looking like this. It, it's a, it's, People say it's sort of a proto-language, but it's not exactly. I mean, it's a little more like birds in a way. But anyway, so here are these males in these multi-male populations, right, where uh, the baby, they, they know that a lot of these babies are not theirs, right? They see a leopard, and they don't hesitate. They start shrieking the alarm call, right? How can that be selected for? Because the leopard's going to go eat him, right, even though the others get away, right? Um, and, um, uh, this sort of behavior caused J.B.S. Haldane uh, to produce a lot of mathematics uh, and to come up with the idea, he says, I would not lay down my life for a brother, but I would do so for two brothers or eight cousins. Because right? two brothers, that's 50, they're each 50%, that adds up to him in an evolutionary context as far as his entire genetics go. Right? And eight cousins as well. So, um, you know, he's, he's giving a limit there on altruism. Um, but the idea is that what appears to be altruism, right, that this vervet calling out, um, it, altruism at the individual level, uh, it favors its extended family. As long as some of those individuals are related, they share some of his genes. As long as there's more than two brothers and eight cousins in the group, then he is effectively continuing at the sort of genetic or evolutionary level. Uh, and that increases the proportion of those individuals in that population. Darwin knew this. Right? It, it's amazing the, the innovations that we find. And you go back to Darwin and like, oh, yeah, it, it's in there. He says, selection may be applied to the family and may thus gain the desired end. Thus, a well-cooked vegetable, a well-flavored vegetable is cooked and the individual is destroyed. But the horticulturist sows seeds of the same stock and confidently expects to get nearly the same variety. 
Breeders of cattle wish the flesh and fat to be well marbled together. The animal has been slaughtered, so it can't be bred. But the breeder goes with, with confidence to the same family to produce it. But getting back to uh, our, uh, uh, our issue of polyspecific associations, of multi-species packs, right? Polyspecific association, multi-species packs, is not really kin selection. It's, it's beyond even uh, unrelated individuals. Um, and so there must be emergent properties, because why would these zebra flock with these wildebeest when they could be flocking with other zebras that would also give them advantages, such as uh, you know, a, uh, more outcrosses possible for you know, less inbreeding, this sort of thing. Uh, but they, they flock with zebras. They flock a little bit with giraffes. Um, heard with them. So, so anyway, the polyspecific association of interest here is, of course, the dogs. And right around 60,000 years ago now, this is pretty well pinpointed, dogs and humans formed a social bond that predates the fully modern form of either one. And here we have Balto in the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Um, and people say, oh, he looks wolf-like. You look at a wolf, Balto doesn't look all that wolf-like. You know, he's much shorter muzzled, he's got a bigger head, he's got shorter legs. And you can tell the difference in the fossil record between dogs and wolves. Um, sometimes even in the same area, you can plot and they, they, they plot out very discreetly. Uh -huh. So um, how that bond came about, why we took up with wolves, uh, has much argued over. But it has now become really very clear that it is not a species prior to us, to Homo sapiens sapiens, around 60,000 years ago. It was our species alone that forged this connection with man's best friend, not these guys. Our species, and meaning specifically what gets called the Cro-Magnon people, right? Although there were, have been multiple successive migrations out of Africa, uh, the ones that uh, came out around 60,000 years ago and are our direct ancestors, um, and that evolved in Africa a good 100,000 years before that, uh, that's, that's us, and we tend to call them Cro-Magnons after a town in France. Right. They had very sophisticated technology. Uh, they were producing art like these cave paintings and incised drawings and carved figures and sort of thing, beautiful ones. And the dates on this, these are going back uh, earlier and earlier as well. And there are so, some examples in Africa from 130,000 years ago even. <clears throat> so anyway, how did we get hooked up together? Were the ancestral wolves following humans camps and scavenging from our kills and our trash heaps and that sort of thing? That's a popular notion that's a, a popular among scientists as well of how that could have happened. Okay. Did dog ancestors join our hunts and not just scavenge the remains, but join in and start working with us to help make the kill uh, and become partners that way? Well, again, we, um, we have a high opinion of ourselves. Why wouldn't you say we joined wolf packs, which were already established in Europe, knew how to bring down big game, right? Uh, it would make sense that we sort of encroached on them uh, and reaped the benefits, right? Uh, they can teach us a lot about how to hunt, how to, you know, the give and take, this sort of thing, uh, especially on this harsh ice landscape that we were not used to dealing with coming up from Africa. Right? And uh, this was a, uh, a landscape with very limited visibility compared to the savannas that we'd come from. So it may be that we piggybacked on dogs in order to survive. Right? And maybe some of our social behaviors just happened to click. Uh, you know. I don't know if you've ever howled with dogs, but it's really very fun. Um, and if you look at social canids, right, the play factor is very high. Right. And this is actually a wolf, this is not a dog. Uh, you see a lot of playing in wolves. Right. So something just makes sense there. And recently, last year, um, Pat Shipman, an anthropologist, has put forward the theory that, in fact, uh, dogs, the domestication of dogs, helped us, Homo sapiens sapiens, supplant the Neanderthals in Europe. And beyond just saying this is probably the case, she says, if you look, there are a few special considerations about our anatomy, uh, such as that we see so much white in our eye, right? Don't shoot till you get close enough to see the whites of the eyes, right? Most animals, you don't see the sclera. You don't see the whites of the eyes. She says that this was selected for so that dogs could read our glances while hunting, so we wouldn't have to, to make noises, right? 
um, it's an interesting proposition. So, however it did come about, by 30,000 years ago, there were multiple domestication events of dogs. And here, a um, 27-year-old dog in the Czech Republic, uh, and again, this can be told very discreetly from the nearby wolf population at the time. Um, not all humans were burying their dead at this time. It was, it was a little innovative, right? This dog got buried just with the same rights as uh, uh, funeral rights as a, as a human and with a mammoth bone in his mouth to take him into the next life. So, you know, 20,000 years after that, right, a lot of cave paintings la later, none of which have dogs in them, interestingly, or wolves, um, we start to see the Neolithic and, and uh, sort of pre-civilization. This is a burial dated to bet between 8 and 10,000 uh, BC uh, in uh, an Israeli village called Ein Malaha. And uh, this is a woman, and she was buried head to head, forehead to forehead, with a, a little dog with her hand on top of his head. Is there a simpler model other than mammals in working out these issues of kin selection or a group selection. Um, I, I'm thinking of uh, experiences where, where uh, birds give signals to other birds, and, and that's a much simpler model than the ones here, it would seem. I wonder if, if there's much been done along those lines. Yeah, birds are a, a, the, the object of a lot of attention on this sort of thing. And bird calls are, and songs are very interested because some of them, they're born knowing. Right? Some of them, uh, they have to learn from their group in order to do it. And if, and if they're not brought up with their group, they don't learn the right song. Some of them, they have to learn to a certain point. And then they have to make innovations, which allows individuals, you know, different females to be attracted to the male or that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, um, the idea of kin selection with the, the, is, is used you know, across all of these uh, uh, different um, subfields to try to explain the behavior that we see. Um, insects are the, you know, the focus of a lot of it, right? And in a way, they're the easiest case, right? Because um, you've got uh, not just um, individual behavior, uh, but actually um, a different uh, chromosomal system, right? So that those um, sterile workers are, um, uh, only have one copy of each chromosome instead of two. It's gone sort of that far. Uh, but the challenge then is, how do you extend something like that, which is kind of obligate eusociality, to folks like us that have a, an option, that have options, right? Uh, that have not such uh, hard-wired behavior in them. Uh, will, you, will this just turn into chaos, or are you really going to get selection for what we might want to call moral behavior? So you sort of alluded to this, but I'm curious about uh, mutualism is something that exists uh, outside of what we normally call sort of domestication relationships. So I'm wondering if, if there are certain features in animals that we develop those intense mutualisms with that we call domestication that separate them from, from other animals that we don't develop those relationships with. Yeah, so it's a good question. There are definite advantages in sort of Darwinian terms for domesticated animals, right? Uh, the, the number of cattle in the world now is much higher than it would have been. Uh, so there, from, from, again, sort of the numbers view, there are definite uh, advantages. In fact, there are jokes about how um, the development of laboratory genetics really boosted the Drosophila population, and suddenly they're being kept in these really cushy circumstances and fed all this great stuff and you know, that sort of thing. Um, but of course, everything is symbiosis in us, right? We have more bacterial cells in our bodies than we have of our so-called own cells, right? And once you start looking, symbiosis is everywhere, and mutualism is, is most of it. Mutualism typically being, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, we both get, you know, some benefit, but we don't have a lot of interaction. Commensalism being that it's actually very beneficial for both. And so we see a lot of, of, of commensalism even. And I would want to, I would say that these polyspecific associations are an instance of, of commensalism. The uh, association between wolves or between the animal and man would be, be beneficial, but during the transitional period where you're going from a, a wolf to Lassie, uh, 
Wouldn't that be a somewhat dangerous animal to have in a camp uh, with children? I mean, you're talking a 100-pound carnivore uh, that's not tame. Uh, how, would, how would that work in a hunter-gatherer tribe without uh, having the kids eaten? Yeah, so again, it's, uh, it's something worth contemplating. And, and the idea that, you know, here in the university, and we like to think of these evolutionary ideas kind of in the abstract, but nature red in tooth and claw, yeah, there's absolutely got to be a risk, and not just to the kids, right? Um, <clears throat> but you've also got risks to those wolves <clears throat> the same way. Humans do a lot of really stupid things to, to animals, right? And so there's a huge risk to the wolf cubs just being around baby humans, right? You pick them up, you squeeze them too tight, you drop them, sort of thing. So somehow in all of that mix, in some cases, it must have been advantageous. And it seems to have happened very fast. Just curious if, if there's any evidence of, of intentional breeding when, when that was first uh, likely to have occurred. Right, so um, I would say none whatsoever. On the other hand, how would you even recognize that? Um, the um, interesting, <clears throat> um, more interesting than I think for, for dogs, because again, we don't, well, anyway, uh, more interesting I think than for, for dogs is horses. Uh, folks in the Pyrenees were corralling horses into small canyons 25,000 years ago. Were they domesticating horses? Were they selectively breeding them? There is indication of what's called cribbing, where the horse is bored. He's locked up and he's bored, and he grabs the edge of the stall with his front teeth and, and swallows air. I mean, it's one of these unfortunate behaviors and can be very bad for the horse, right? Um, I think it's likely that they were not you know, selectively breeding these horses. But if you're going to lock up a horse for a while, you want it to be one that's aesthetically pleasing, because why not? You know? Or if you're corralling them up and you're eating some of them, right, uh, then you might leave ones that were in some manner more attractive. And we find at that time period of, from DNA that you probably know about this, DNA that's been done, there was a higher instance of, incidence of leopard spotted horses, white horses with, with spots on them at that time, uh, which is just really interesting. You can think about how that could come about. But again, humans think that they uh, do, a, I mean, I breed dogs. I know how hard it is. It's a whole lot harder than anybody thinks. <laughs> and so we, we tend to fancy that we're producing these things, but very often it's nature and we're just taking the credit. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Patricia Princehouse. Dr. Princehouse is Director of the Origins Major and of the Program in Evolutionary Biology at Case Western Reserve University. In the second part of our talk, we learned about the bond between dogs and early Homo sapiens. In our final segment, Dr. Princess will discuss stages of puppy development. Now, back to our talk. Which leads us to civilized dogs, right? Um, the Neolithic then gave way to, in, in some quarters, what we call civilization. And a very interesting thing happened. They didn't just look like these uh, sort of Norwegian elk hound type dogs. You got huge variation, right? Um, <clears throat> the diversity of human occupations proliferated. And so did those for dogs. And as the dog's features began to change, uh, you know, they were more suited for certain roles and vice versa. And purebred dog breeds emerged. A couple thousand years later, you have the Industrial Revolution. Society is not quite as, as, as set as it had been. And so the roles that people take on in the industrialized world are quite different from their traditional, you know, uh, uh, roles and the ones that the dogs that they used with them also. And so some of these breeds started to disappear. And around the time of Darwin, you started getting the rise of these um, uh, dog societies, right? Kennel clubs, things like that, wanting to preserve these uh, breeds that had been in people's families for generations and generations. You know, the, the lace workers in Paris had these French bulldogs, and, and the uh, shepherds in the Pyrenees had these little shaggy herding dogs. Uh, and uh, so they tried to, uh, to maintain the characteristics, not just the physical characteristics, but also the behavioral characteristics. And this this little Italian greyhound here has got a cat cornered under a chair, right? But it's exhibiting the same behavior that its greyhound ancestors used to hunt down prey, right? And so uh, there are now a lot of games that, uh, that people use for dogs uh, for different activities. Terriers, for example, for hunting out mice. They don't get to kill the mice. 
but they, uh, they have these trials, things like that. Um, and it's a lot of fun. But regardless of what the breed is, or what it was originally you know, supposed to do, or what people used it for, you can look back to that evolutionary heritage of uh, wolves uh, and understand a bit about dog development. And so uh, a lot of people know that puppies are born with their eyes closed and their ears closed, right? Uh, this is one of my own puppies, by the way. This is a Lakeland Terrier uh, uh, owned by a friend of mine, right, with puppies. From really, for the first three weeks, they're largely unresponsive. They gradually get a little more responsive toward three weeks, but there's a big sort of speed bump at three weeks where it really changes. And they spend most of their time doing this. They even have a thing called activated sleep because they don't get any exercise. They, their muscles twitch. If you watch a puppy, they'll, their muscles will twitch. And that's building up their muscles for when they'll need to support their weight. Right? Um, so uh, and experiments done, unpleasant experiments done, uh, have even indicated that uh, puppies exposed to an electric shock with a strong smell attached, take like 80 some trials to learn to avoid that situation. They are really unresponsive, right? They're little, little slug-like guys. Um, so they, the eyes gradually open around two weeks, 15, uh, 10 to 15 days. Um, now responsible breeders, folks like me that belong to these kennel clubs and that are concerned about preserving the history of these breeds and stuff like that. Um, we have all kinds of stuff that we do, right? You want to take the puppy to the vet at that time. You want to check for issues of the heart and stuff like that. And there are also these super puppy exercises that we do. The super puppy exercises were actually developed by the military to help decrease stress in war dogs. And uh, again, based on a whole lot of research, um, but they correspond. The military didn't do this because of wolf evolution, but they correspond to some aspects of wolves, of wolf development, right? And so in the super puppy exercises, uh, you do things like hold the puppy upright and then hold it upside down. You tickle one of its feet, you take a cold compress, you know, like ice, and you put it on their tummy for about 10 seconds, right? And you do these once or twice a day uh, for the first uh, uh, 21 days, basically, at least 18 days. So wolf cubs are born just as unresponsive. This is a wolf, and that's one of my puppies, which will look very different in adulthood. They look pretty similar at this, at this point, right? But in the den setting, they are getting stimulation from the mother. They may be getting bumped by uh, some of the other members of the pack. Uh, they're stressed naturally by changing temperature, um, different smells, different sounds, this sort of thing. Uh, this is, in many ways, super puppy exercises for wolf, club, wolf cubs. Um, a lot of the cubs do die. Uh, and not just from some defect, but simply because there was another pup there first. It was born earlier than the others, you know, than, than this pup perhaps, and it gets pushed off the nipple, and it doesn't get enough, and it dies. So you end up with this initial population of, you know, uh, being whittled down to just a few cubs. Um, and it also things like just bad luck or the poor condition of the mother if they're born too late in the season or too early in the season, things like that. Around three to five weeks, between three to five weeks, the wolf cub is waking up, becoming very interactive with its surroundings. It's learning to toddle around and uh, uh, eventually how to sort of run a little bit. Um, in nature, they're exposed to all kinds of different tastes and smells and surfaces, and the cub is very hesitant, which is good. You can see how that could easily be selected for. Cubs that are, you know, overly curious. Uh, can succumb to accidents or just lack of coordination. They don't have very good coordination, so if they want to go running off after something, they're likely to break their neck. In domestic, civilized dogs, it's the same thing. Puppy wakes up to the world at three weeks and begins to look around. But you know, if you're just in the barn, there's not all that much to do if you've just got the puppies locked in a stall or in a doghouse out back, right? And so again, breeders like me, we do all of these things. We take them to different surfaces. We take them to different rooms in the house. We let them smell things. We put different uh, things in the whelping box for them to be on. Uh, and especially as they get toward five weeks, we start taking them places. So. Uh, uh, there's always the concern that the puppy could be exposed to diseases. I err on the side of socialization, and my puppies at five weeks are going out places. Especially if you take them out, you put them down, and you walk away from them, and they learn to follow you. 
between five and seven weeks, the wolf cubs are really starting to get their, their thing going. Um, they're much more coordinated. Uh, they're starting to make causal connections between things that happen. Right? Uh, and they're really doing a lot of interpersonal uh, behavior that um, uh, causes them to be more and more sophisticated. So they're integrating as pack members at this point. But if they read the uh, other members of the pack wrong, they could even get killed by that. So it's extremely important at this stage that they're very plastic in their behavior, uh, but that they also have a sort of a, a uh, you know, places in their mind to put different activities. Same thing with the, the uh, civilized dog. The puppy's getting more coordinated. This is a five week old, five, six week old puppy running with its father. And uh, suddenly they find they can do all this stuff. Right? And so it's the breeder's responsibility, because puppies shouldn't leave home until at least seven weeks, right? To get them out, to get them exposed to other dogs, to teach them games and things like that, and supply the sort of stimulation that a wolf cub would have had naturally in the wild if you want this dog to grow up and be a, you know, a real performer. I've had three dogs on the world team, uh, not with me, with people that have gotten them for me, but I've bred them. And uh, these dogs were raised in this manner. It makes a difference. Um, so anyway, you want to, again, get them on different surfaces and introduce to people. And uh, the more things you can teach them at this point, the better. They learn amazingly well at this point. Moving up in time a little bit, uh, between seven and 10 weeks um, in the wolf pack, the cubs are getting integrated. Pack behaviors are starting to develop. They start getting very strongly bonded to their pack, and they're averse to spending time alone. And here's where you want to depart from this understanding. You want to be aware of what would happen with a wolf, but we don't want our dogs to be pack animals in modern society. We want them to be individuals and to become sort of members of our family. And so here's where you want to take the puppy out of that litter context and put it into a bunch of different contexts with you. And the training that you've been doing helps with this. And this is the best time for the puppy to go to its new owner. And then the new owner has the responsibility of taking the puppy out a lot of places and also continuing that training so that it's doing all, all sorts of tricks. You have, and people are constantly thinking up new things to do with the dog. Uh, you've got these 10-week-old puppies uh, opening a suitcase and getting into it and closing it on top of them, putting all of their feet into Tupperware and slowly I mean, amazing things. If you go online you, on YouTube, you'll see them doing. Uh, but it doesn't matter what you're training them. Uh, to do. It's the idea that you're doing what I call laying down a template for learning. And the wolf cub at that age is laying down its template and it's putting everything in place. You want your puppy to lay down a template for learning uh, so that it is open to new activities and experiences and so that it's learning how different people are so that they can know which people they should be suspicious of and which ones are just a little weird but they're fine. Okay. Um, and uh, so the wolf cub by about 12 weeks has pretty much finished laying down this template and it's got its place in the pack and it's pretty well secure there. Um, as the cubs venture further and further afield with the pack, uh, they have to quickly overcome the challenges that they encounter. Um, same thing with the puppy, right? By 12 weeks, your puppy has its adult brain in many ways. And uh, you, if you have not started training until 12 weeks, you've risked, missed a real window. Right, so there's lots of tricks and puzzles and things that should be done. From there, uh, the wolf club matures in the pack. Um, it's uh, more independent, but it's still very attached to the pack. Same thing with the puppy. The cognitive uh, uh, development slows. Uh, the emotional development is very slow. Um, but it becomes a bit more independent, uh, but very, very attached to us. And socialization is very important to support the right sort of behaviors. Um, the cub from six to 12 months in the wolf pack, it starts getting really integrated. It starts hunting. It starts doing a lot of pack activities. With civilized dogs, particularly ones you want to leave with the livestock, there are changes you can make in their training at this point, putting them out in a larger pasture sort of thing. Um, so anyway, all of these things you can think of as transformations of wolf behavior into the, the modern dog. Uh, so you can see wolves here, wolves trailing something. Uh, and you can see how they're slowly and deliberately moving. If you look at a pointer, right, they've arrested that stalking behavior. And it's not always with the front leg, sometimes it's with the rear leg. So you've got a transformation of a wolf hunting behavior in a dog that looks totally different. Hunting behaviors, when you have a pack surrounding uh, a prey animal, there's a moment where they see it and they 
it stops and they stop. And there's this calculation done, right? We have that in sheepdogs too. It's called the lift. The second that the stock really starts to respond to the dog, there's this moment, right? In sheepdogs, you have, okay, you've had the lift, you walk up to start moving the flock in a particular direction. So does the wolf, is that same look. But in this border collie, uh, you've got that freezing, just like in the pointer. So it's, it's sort of arrested there, and then you tell it to continue. Um, wearing, uh, hunting down this, uh, uh, this animal. These wolves are coming around to the side to herd it back one direction or another. Right? We see this same behavior uh, in the sheepdogs, right, of all these different breeds. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, and be happy to take more questions. This lecture is part of the Origins Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. It has been brought to you with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, and MediaVision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.